Hello there, you're watching All24 News coming up next in our news program. In a statement by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Algeria strongly condemns the terrorist attacks in the Ugandan capital, Kampala Plus. Democrats postponed a vote on Joe Biden's $1.75 trillion Build Back Better bill after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy delivered an extended parliamentary statement that blocked efforts to pass it. And finally, in our news file, we'll be discussing the unhumanitarian conditions of Palestinian prisoners in Zionist prisons. Hello again and welcome. First in our top stories in a statement by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Algeria strongly condemned the terrorist attacks in the Ugandan capital Kampala, expressing Algeria's support to the Ugandan people. It's worth mentioning that the last Tuesday, a twin suicide bombing has hit the Ugandan capital Kampala, which killed six people and injured 30 others. Let's follow this report. Algeria condemned the attacks in the Ugandan capital Kampala on Tuesday, which left six people dead and 30 injured. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs stated that Algeria supports the Ugandan people and government against the terrorist aggression and extends its deepest condolences to the families of the victims and wishes a speedy recovery for the injured. The statement added that the Ugandan people will know in these difficult times how to mobilize their strengths and overcome these difficult situations. The Algerian foreign minister stressed that eliminating terrorism requires active solidarity at the continental level, as well as increased cooperation to revitalize the mechanism put in place to confront this ever-growing scourge. Police spokesperson Fred Enanga says 21 suspects have been arrested and that all information suggests that this attack is linked to the radicals of the ADF, Allied Democratic Forces. The hallmarks of the attack clearly indicate that the ADF-linked radicalized groups uh, who still have a desire to carry out lethal attacks on soft targets using suicide attackers and uh, improvised explosive devices uh, behind these attacks. This comes within the framework of Algeria's efforts to combat terrorism in Africa. For the last Monday, Ramtala Mamra, Minister of Foreign Affairs and National Community Abroad, called before the ministerial meeting of the Peace and Security Council of the African Union for the need to formulate and adopt a comprehensive and integrated approach aimed at addressing the root causes of terrorism. China has moved its focus to asserting control over peacetime activity across the South China Sea since completing the construction of its artificial islands bases in the Spartly Islands in 2016. The growth of China's maritime or marine militia, a group of vessels support, supposedly engaged in commercial fishing, but actually working alongside Chinese law enforcement and military to achieve political goals, goals in contested waters has been a crucial component of this transition. Islam Sidi reports. According to a fresh allegation, hundreds of vessels are being sponsored by Beijing to back its expanding claim in the dispute at waterways. Despite UN agreements control international waters, China has aggressively expanded its nine-dash line, leaving many of its neighbors with little alternatives for reclaiming their territory. Around 300 vessels from China's marine militia monitor the Spartly Islands in the South China Sea, as Beijing maintains its contentious claim to the dispute of waters. Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei and Taiwan all claim parts of the South China Sea, where China has built artificial islands with airstrips, sheltered ports and other military infrastructures. China's marine militia dates back to the 1950s coastal defense operations. Since taking the parcel islands from Vietnam in the 1970s, the militia has grown in size and scope, aided by government fundings for fuel, construction and repairs, and has become an important tool in Beijing's territorial and maritime claims. Three Chinese Coast Guard vessels were accused of blocking and firing water cannon or resupplying boats heading for Philippine-controlled atoll in the South China Sea, which the Philippines condemned in the harshest terms. According to Philippine media, the majority of activity has avoided violent confrontation. All the militia tactics escalated in 2019, when a Chinese vessel struck and sank a wooden Filipino fishing boat 
anchored northeast of the Spartley Islands, before being rescued by a nearby Vietnamese boat. Experts have described China's maritime militia as a classic illustration of its grey zone tactics, which allow it to enforce its sovereignty in places where all the countries have competing claims without resorting to traditional combat. United States President Joe Biden, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez are set to meet in person in Washington, D.C. for the first time in five years to discuss economic integration, immigration and COVID-19 pandemic. Marwa Belaiwa reports. President Joe Biden has revived the so-called Three Amigos Summit, in which he planned a meeting with the leaders of Canada and Mexico, their first three-sided summit in five years. The meeting said to be discussed long-standing issues such as climate change, migration, economic competitiveness, as well as newer challenges such as the COVID-19 pandemic. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Mexican President Andre Manuel López Obrador met with the U.S. President Joe Biden at the White House on Thursday. The leaders are reported to have bilateral meetings with Biden before converging for the first North American Leader Summit in five years. While the meeting aims to further joint economic cooperation, both Canada and Mexico are worried about Biden's Buy America provisions and a proposed electric vehicle tax credit that would favor unionized U.S.-based constructors. The main points to be discussed in this summit have been the center of issues of both sides with former President Donald Trump since 2016. Biden's social spending and climate bill is being considered in Congress. The later includes up to $12,500 in tax credits for U.S.-made electric vehicles, including $4,500 credit for union-made vehicles. This raised the concern of the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. On the other hand, the U.S. has been pressuring Mexico to find solutions to prevent migrants, mostly from Central America and the Caribbean, from reaching the border. And for further updates about the same story, U.S. President Joe Biden welcomed his Mexican counterpart and the Canadian Prime Minister to the Three Friends Summit. Biden stated that the summit is about what the three countries can do today as partners and in mutual respect to strengthen the region and demonstrate that democracies can deliver results in the 21st century. For his part, Justin Trudeau expressed his happiness for being part of this discussion that will shape the course for the future. On the other hand, Andres Manuel Lopez stressed that the advantages of economic integration, describing it as the best way to control or to confront China. In their closing statement, the three leaders pledged to work together on migration and climate change without talking about any concrete steps and announced a new summit in Mexico in 2020. Democrats postponed a vote on Joe Biden's $1.75 trillion Build Back Better bill after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy delivered a extended parliamentary statement that blocked efforts to pass it. Marwa Blaywar again. Biden signed into law the infrastructure package, which primarily allocates federal funds to repairing roads, bridges, tunnels, and other transportation systems, and has eventually traveled the country praising its benefits to voters. After an independent government agency predicted the spending measure would add $376 billion to the federal debt over the next decade, Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic Speaker of the House, announced that the lower chamber of Congress would vote on it. This agenda invests in long-term economic capacity and will enhance the ability of more Americans to participate productively in the economy. Steny Hoyer, the Democratic House Majority Leader, informed legislators that the vote would be held on Friday morning after McCarthy invoked his privilege to speak indefinitely from the floor. This bill is truly for the people, not just those who have much, but those who have too little. Many Americans are looking at the investments this bill would make in America's workers and families and asking, how are we going to afford it? McCarthy slammed the legislation and the Biden administration in a four-hour speech that criticized everything from COVID-19 restrictions to migration at the U.S.-Mexico border. 
For nearly four years, as the House Republicans have been voicing the needs of millions of Americans, House Democrats have broken nearly every rule and standard in order to silence dissident and stack the deck for their radical, unpopular agenda. Despite that the White House has insisted that the bill would be fully paid for, moderate Democrats have raised concerns that the package will increase the debit while many Americans are concerned about raising inflation. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said when speaking to the Association of German City Leaders the fourth wave of COVID-19 hits Germany with full force. She described the pandemic situation as dramatic as COVID-19 cases rise significantly. That of Jenny on what follow. Germany's Angela Merkel has described the COVID-19 situation in her country as dramatic, as the outgoing chancellor considers how to deal with an infection rate that has hit a record. The present pandemic situation is dramatic. I can describe it differently. The fourth wave has hit our country with full force. And even though there is legal ground for the pandemic national emergency situation, I have no doubt that we are among such a difficult situation. Merkel's comments come after the Robert Koch Institute, Germany's public health body, reported a further 52,826 new cases Wednesday and a further 294 deaths. To date, Germany has recorded 5.1 million cases and almost 100,000 fatalities from COVID-19, according to Johns Hopkins University. The daily figure of new COVID-19 cases is higher than ever before, during the pandemic, and the number of patients is raising very rapidly. And what's also frightening is the number of deaths in the country. Several states and cities have already imposed more COVID measures and have required the public to show COVID passes, which have an individual's vaccination status or if they've just recovered from the virus in order to access public areas. Inflation rate hits the top around the world and supply chain issue is worsening and the shortage of food supplies as food prices rocket in post-pandemic areas. Usam Ayedi has more to be clarified. World's economy is reaching one of the worst situations in ages. The surge in consumer goods prices is rising in a scary way. And even biggest economic powers around the globe are facing an economic collapse, which resulted in inflation. The UN has recently warned that global supply chain crunch is likely to further fuel inflation around the world. World economy polls, including China, the USA and the UK, are witnessing a push-up in consumer prices. This price soar is due to supply chain issues that biggest shipping companies are facing, in addition to oil and gas prices, which increase in a scary way. Economists believe that COVID-19 pandemic and bottlenecks imports are the biggest threat to the world's economy. This inflation rates wouldn't be unprecedented, as during the financial downturn in 2008, inflation rates rose to 5%, compared to the current 3% rate. Governments and populations are concerned about the issue, and inflation is being felt all around the world, and worry of economists show that prices are going in a one-way direction, which will further complicate matters for economy superiors and consumers. After a year-long protest against new farming laws, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced his country would repeal the three contentious agricultural laws that he believed were put with good intention. Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi announced that his government would make reforms in the controversial farm laws, a decision that aims to overhaul the country's struggling agriculture sector. Three agriculture laws that farmers have been protesting against for more than a year would be repealed, Modi announced in an address to the nation. Today, I have come to tell you, the whole country, that we have decided to withdraw all the three agricultural laws. In the parliament session starting at the end of this month, we will complete the constitutional process to repeal these agricultural laws. Modi maintained that the farming laws were brought in with good intentions by the government, however, they failed to convey this to the farmers. The Indian Prime Minister admitted his government failed to win the argument with small farmers. Today, while apologizing to the countrymen, I want to say with sincere and pure heart that perhaps there may have been something lacking in our pious efforts. 
due to which we were not able to explain to some farmers the truth which was as evident as the light of the lamp. Maybe something was lacking in our opinions, which is why we could not convince some farmers about the loss. In a tweet, Narendra Modi said his government decided to repeal the three farm laws, urging the protesters to return home. The Indian farmers' protest is an ongoing protest where tens of thousands of farmers marched to the capital, Delhi, to protest farming reforms against three farms acts, which were passed by the Parliament of India in September 2020. Farmers will continue the protests until laws will be officially repealed. UN Ambassador Deborah Lyons warns that the Taliban will be unable to defeat Daesh in Afghanistan and mentioned that the terrorist group has expanded from a few districts and Kabul to almost all of the country. Let's follow this report. The UN envoy for Afghanistan, Deborah Lyons, warned that the Taliban is unable to stop the growth of ISIS Afghanistan affiliate. She told the UN Security Council that the terrorist is increasingly active. There is some data that indicated the group has dramatically escalated attacks across the country from mid-August, when the Taliban were increasingly taking ground from former recognized government, following the Taliban's seizure of power. With about a 40% reduction in GDP since August, and Lyons warned that it would increase the risk of terrorism. According to Dabur Alliance, as formal economy remains weak, the informal one, including illicit drugs, arms, shipments, and human trafficking will gain more traction. As stated by the UN envoy, the focus for the next three or four months should be helping the most needy Afghans in surviving the winter, while not damaging the institutions and coping mechanism that keep the rest of the population from sliding into greater danger. Iran restarted its banned nuclear work, resulted in a report by the International Atomic Agency, uh, which urged the country's government to give more explanations about the activity, while GCC-US partnership showed concerns about security in the region. Ayadi Uzama has more. Conflict between Iran and UN is reaching advanced level in dispute and complications. Ahead of Vienna talks, a report by the International Atomic Energy Agency has been released, which raised concern and skepticism over the increase of uranium stockpile in Tehran, which has been urged to give explanations about uranium particles in non-declared sites of the country. Iran's acting representative in UN Vienna-based headquarter exhorted a making a rushed or politically motivated statement. However, he gave no further elaboration. Mohammad Riza Ghaibi immediately responded to the report, and he explained that Tehran notified the agency of the move of purifying uranium up to 60%, and his country is cooperative with the UN despite technical difference issue. This International Atomic Energy Agency report overshadowed the next round of Vienna talks, and according to experts, it will facilitate the task to Europe to put more pressure on Iran. On the other hand, Gulf Cooperation Council and U.S. Strategic Partnership condemned a range of what they called dangerous and aggressive policies, which is likely to threaten the security of the region. And Gulf Cooperation Council members briefed on their efforts to build effective diplomatic channels with Iran to prevent, resolve and de-escalate conflicts. In a National Atomic Energy Agency report accused Iran of starting its banned nuclear work after the withdrawal of the USA from the 2015 deal and reimposed sanctions on Tehran, while the latter insists it has never sought developing nuclear weaponry. Palestinians witness death and arrestations every day. This week has been full of sorrow as Zionist forces killed a young man and arrested his parents while an imprisoned citizen died to do medical negligence amid protests and clashes in West Bank in Gaza. Let's follow. Zionist crimes in Palestinian-occupied West Bank are intensified. A 16-year-old Palestinian young man was killed by occupation police forces in eastern Kudus city. The martyr was accused of stabbing two occupation policemen, and his parents were arrested few hours after his death, as neighbors and locals showed their support for the young man's parents, which led to direct clashes between the forces and locals, as Palestinian citizens in the area threw rocks on the forces. On the other part, the 39-year-old Palestinian Sami Amur passed away in Zionist custody at Soroka Hospital in the Nakab on Thursday. 
suffering from congenital heart problems, while Palestinian groups considered his death as a result of medical negligence, which is the prominent policy of Zionist forces that put numbers of Palestinians to death since the occupation of Palestinian territories. Sami Amur was imprisoned in 2008 in Dar al balah in Gaza, and he was sentenced to 19 years in addition to banning from family visits. Many high-profile figures in Palestine pledged support for Palestinian civil society groups who were considered terrorist organizations by the Zionist forces. And they warned that the Zionist designation put the whole civil society at risk, and not only the organizations themselves. Zionist crimes against Palestinian civilians is stepping from worse to worse, amid the silence of international opinion and strong resistance of the population. And to talk more about the suffrage of the Palestinian prisoners in Zionist prisons, I'm joined live via phone by Dr. Mahfoud Ali Zoui, Algerian author and academic lecturer at Galma University. First, Mahfoud, how can you describe the conditions of Palestinian prisoners in Zionist prisons? Thank you so much uh, for having me again and uh, a blessed Friday to everybody. So there are now around 5,000 uh, Palestinian prisoners in uh, the Zionist prisons. And uh, according to reports by the Palestinian and uh, some international organizations, their conditions, of course, have, have been always, which have been always uh, inhuman, have been worryingly uh, deteriorating since the escape of uh, the six prisoners from the Gilboa prison uh, last September. Um, usually prisoners are subject to various violations on, on a daily basis. Uh, these violations range from uh, physical abuse to depriving prisoners from the right to be visited by, by their families to the major violation of the so-called uh, administrative de detention. Just for our viewers who do not have an idea about uh, what does uh, administrative detention mean, it, it involves simply arresting Palestinians from the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and putting them in prison without charge or trial for a period up to six months. And the problem is that uh, this period of six months is renewable by military order, not by judicial decree, which is a major violation of international law and basic uh, human rights. Uh, now we have around 500 uh, Palestinian who is uh, an administrative detainee, which makes uh, around 10% of uh, all Palestinian prisoners in, in, in the Zionist prison. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Mahfoud, uh, despite and talking about the inhuman, inhuman conditions in the Zionist prisons, why don't we see serious actions from the part of the Arabic and international humanitarian organizations to help at least improve the rights of Palestinian prisoners? This is a very good uh, question. Uh, the fact that uh, the pressure on the Zionist government from the international community, especially the states that used to play a mediation, uh, has noticeably decreased in recent years, and this is very noticeable. While the reasons are very complicated, uh, personally, I, I would like to wonder about the possible role of uh, the Arab countries that have recently no normalized their relations with the Israeli occupation and the claim that uh, they negotiated their agreement with the Zionist state in terms favorable to the Palestinian people. So we are waiting what these, the, 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 these countries can do to help uh, the, the, the Palestinians. Uh, we have here a humanitarian crisis. Uh, uh, re relating to these uh, administrative prisoners and other prisoners. Indeed, this brings us to our class question that says when it comes to the unlawful administrative detentions of Palestinians, what are the moves Palestinian government is taking to stop these illegal actions towards the Palestinians? Well, personally, I, I, I don't expect a lot from the, uh, the, the, the Palestinian Authority, which uh, has launched what is called an international campaign against uh, the administrative detention of Palestinians. Uh, but this, this move, uh, uh, in the first place, comes uh, after a number of prisoners, Palestinian prisoners, uh, started a hunger strike uh, to protest their administrative detention, which is unfortunately the only means to grab the attention to their suffering and uh, their, their ordeal. Other Palestinian organizations, especially uh, Nadil Asil Palestini, the Palestinian Prisoner Club, are, are doing, in my view, uh, they are doing a good job by exposing uh, the major violations of prisoners' rights and by also providing us uh, with updated data on the conditions of these uh, Palestinians. Uh, 
uh, in general, the situation is alarming, and the United States and international human rights uh, should exert more pressure on the Zionist state, especially that uh, some law experts depicted the practice of the so-called administrative uh, detention as a, a, war, a war crime and a crime against humanity. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahfoud Ali Zoui, Algerian author and academic lecturer at Ganma University, who joined us live via phone. And finally, the Canadian province of British Columbia declared a state of emergency following massive floods and landslides caused by record-breaking rainfall in the last several days. The Canadian authorities has also deployed air forces to the area to aid evacuations and support the affected citizens. Epic storm has cut off Vancouver from the rest of Canada. Flooding and mudslides blocked major highways and railways. Travelers were trapped in their vehicles. Catastrophic flooding in British Columbia caused shortage of consumer goods, food supplies, higher diesel and gasoline prices. Things and realized there wasn't much of anything. The storm forced major evacuations and left hundreds of people stranded. Affected towns in remote mountain areas are with limited access and freezing temperatures. Some areas surpassed the average monthly rainfall in only 48 hours. Following the deadly flooding, British Columbia, Canada's third biggest state, declares state of emergency. Steps in this response may necessitate extraordinary measures only available through this declaration under the Emergency Program Act. Trudeau said hundreds of military personnel are deployed to aid the recovery and thousands more are on standby. Everything will be provided to the stricken province. We will continue uh, to be on this and do everything necessary to support people as we get through this extremely difficult time. Declaring a state of emergency gives provincial authorities added powers to restrict travel and order evacuations and implement other emergency plans. A step taken by the Canadian authorities to get out of a natural crisis that occurs only once in a century. And now let's have a look again to our main headlines. In a statement by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Algeria strongly condemns the terrorist attacks in the Ugandan capital, Kampala. Democrats postponed a vote on Joe Biden's $1.75 trillion Build Back Better bill after House Speaker Kevin McCarthy delivered an extended parliamentary statement that blocked efforts to pass it. And in our news file, we discuss the inhumanitarian conditions of Palestinian prisoners in Zionist prisons. That's all for me, Nadia Kasmi, and the rest of the team. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.